three, two, one. Welcome to Bellwether. Thank you for being here this week. I appreciate it as always. This week is going to be one of my fun interview weeks. I've, I do this every once in a while. I bring in a guest who I really think has value for whatever it is that I want to talk about that week. And so this week, you're going to hear the interview in a little bit, but I wanted to give it a little precursor because, you know, I work with corporations on how to operate at a higher level, right? We build learning and development plans. We do all that stuff. And what I have found where most learning and development plans fail is that there is this merging of personal capability and work and, and personal capability and work. And a lot of times, many of the times that I speak with people, I hear from everybody is I don't like my job because I don't feel like I have a sense of purpose and I have no spark and I have this yada, 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 yada. And so a lot of times on this podcast, I'll jump into that personal aspect of, you know, what can you figure out for yourself? Yeah. You know, whatever, um, you know, get your purpose, get your, you know, motivation, whatever it is and find my purpose. You know, last week I talked about how I hate the word resilience. Now find my purpose is kind of in that same camp of, you know, finding purpose and, and people expect their work to give them purpose when in actuality, you can't really just expect a hobby or a purpose to come and do things for you. You actually have to dictate it yourself. And so we have this guest, Scott from Watchestry. Scott uh, has just a cool story. And he's got this cool book, Marine National, where he just found this passion. He stumbled upon this passion where he just thought it was really cool to check out French Navy watches. And then the more he checked out these watches that he really liked, he saw that each watch had stories and he got really into it. And, and so I wanted him to talk about this passion. How do you find passion? How do you find a hobby? How do you find this thing that takes you to a different level? And uh, everybody, when we talk about entrepreneurship, people are like, you know what? I just got to find my purpose and my passion and do that. But what I like about Scott is that he's unapologetically interested in something and it hasn't undone what he has to do for work. And he's a he's a lawyer by day, but he's this watch fanatic at night. And it's not this crazy overtaking his life type of thing, but he found something that's really interesting to him. And so what I would encourage people, and he's got great advice on on how to find that spark and, and how he found his spark and how it kind of comes like at this random time where you're not actually looking for it and, and how to get started. And he's got this perspective uh, called zero dot crap, where you could say, look, I'm just going to get started on something. I'm going to try it. If it doesn't work fine, but whatever, I tried something new and maybe it resonates with me because I've got my four-year-old who won't always eat her dinner the way, you know, just try it. If you don't like it, that's fine, but you just got to try it. And, and many of the things we want to try when we talk about purpose and spark and changing things are really low risk. And when we think about, I want to find my purpose, I have to upend my life, I have to find a new job, I have to do all of these things, we're overcomplicating something that's extremely simple. You say, just what's one step into finding something interesting that, you know, that could lead to something else? If you want to write a book, it's not just saying, oh my God, it's such a big thing to write a book. It's spend every day writing. Spend every day writing something. Maybe it'll turn into a book, maybe not. But if you have a real passion for writing, then just start writing. Stop worrying about this bigger picture that's going on. Um, you know what? I really want to uh, become a personal trainer, but I can't afford to open a gym. You want know to invite people to work out with you in the park on weekends. You, maybe there's something that you could just say, all right, you know, when I first started looking to leave corporate, I didn't know what I wanted to do. The guy I started talking to, he was a coach and he said, look, you know, what can you start doing on the side? Doesn't have to pay money, doesn't have to do anything, but eventually it will overtake what your, your income and your work is going to be. But you just have to start doing it in order to see if it's going to do it. Maybe you're not going to upend your work. You realize that work is this fundamental way to pay for whatever it is that you want to do. Suddenly your perspective is very different on the work that you want to do. So uh, whatever it is that you want to do, Whatever it is that, that you want to follow your passion and never work another day in your life, kind of BS, whatever that is. This isn't about taking over your life. Um, Scott dictated it. Scott found it. He made time for it. He prioritized it. And he's in a nice little little place. So he's, a nice, he's in a really good place. Really good place. So that's good. So I want you to listen to Scott. 
he's just a genuinely nice individual. I found it pretty interesting looking at all these Navy watches and seeing what Navy watches do and, and the fact that there's a story and you could trace it and dig it up. And he got re like really into this um, really cool thing. But get started on whatever it is you want to do. Listen to his story, but listen to the themes. Right? We tried to pull out themes quite a bit on, you know, where do you find spark? Um, don't overthink your spark. It's extremely basic. His ideas on zero point crap, you can apply this to many different ways. If you're managing people in the office, think about this in many different ways in terms of getting them to one particular area. So uh, you'll hear the same thing from successful entrepreneurs, the people who found their passion, their hobbies. They all just said, I had to start somewhere. Okay. And just get started. And you may not know where to get started, but if you don't know where to get started, try different things. And so it's just good. It's just a good philosophy. Get started, try it, learn, continually improve, whatever it is that you want to do. And uh, we know the formula. We all know the formula for finding those hobbies and the passion and everything else. We just don't want to do the work at the beginning. Scott showed that when you do the work, you get this payoff and it's pretty nice. So good luck with it. Here's the interview with Scott. And I hope you enjoy it. I hope you find your spark and I'll see you next week. Thanks. Welcome to Bellwether. Thank you, everybody, for being here. We are live with a very special guest this week, Scott from Watchistry. But what I want to talk to you first is I want to give a framework. We're live on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the reason I wanted Scott on this, on this episode is everybody's been talking over the past 18 months especially during the pandemic, right? We find a lot of the questions that come up when we talk about coaching, when we talk about evolving, learning, developing, all of these things, a lot of the conversation that comes up is a question around purpose. And I want to find my purpose. I want to find my passion. I want to find um, a hobby. I want to find something to do. And, and this really came to the forefront during the pandemic where people had nothing to distract them for an extended period of time. They had to get into their own heads. They didn't know what they were doing and they could have really used a hobby and a hobby would have been good. And people are looking for that now. And I think people are starting to recognize that having a hobby, finding what's important to you and finding some set of purpose to say, you know what, I'm really interested in this. I want to dive into it. I, I think that's really exciting right now. And a lot of people are really focused on that. So I wanted to bring in an expert at that a person who's done it, uh, and a person whose ideas on it, I really appreciate it. Now, granted, he does it in a way that I don't do because he's got a very different interest, but the theory behind it is super interesting. And I, I love just hearing about why he's doing what he's doing and everything else. So I don't want to take all of it away. I'm going to introduce Scott in a minute, but in the meantime, as you join, use the chat, send us a, uh, send us a comment, send us all that stuff and, and we'll, um, uh, we'll we'll make sure that Scott talks about. It. So I want to introduce Scott from Watchistry, lawyer by day, watch hobbyist by night. Scott, tell us who you are, what you're doing, and I want to talk about French watches. And and I'm gonna we're gonna make this interesting for people. Awesome, thank you, Jim, for having me. Uh, so I'm Scott. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm a lawyer by day, but by night and sometimes during the day too, I'm a watch collector. Uh, and uh, I've been collecting about ten years now. And I was very fortunate early on in my collecting journey to have found the, the niche that was just for me. And that was French Navy watches. And uh, I can tell you about how, 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 how it came to be. Um, so I, I want to hear about this because when people, when I think of a hobby and I think of collecting watches, that seems intense. And so, and we've talked a lot about before this of, you know, how do you find the thing that's right for you? Um, there was a guy that I met a long time ago who left corporate and he wanted to start a frozen yogurt shop. And I looked him in the face and my wife thought it was so rude, but it was, I was genuinely curious. I'm like, why frozen yogurt? You can do any business you want. Why frozen yogurt? And so my question for you is, it's not just watches. Yeah. It's French Navy watches. Why French Navy watches? Yeah, it's uh, in, in one word, it's the provenance of, available for that. And what that means is that uh, for 
you know, watches, especially vintage watches, they have a story. Most people don't know what that story is unless you happen to know the person that wore it, you know, their whole life and they, they're passing it down like your grandfather passing it down. Uh, but uh, for military watches, which is the particular genre that these fall in, uh, a lot of times they have engravings or a certain style that would let you know that this watch was actually used by a certain country's military. Typically, that's all you might know. This was used by the U.S. Army. That's it. Uh, with French Navy watches, a lot of times they come with provenance or some documentation available either with the watch or with a little bit of research that you can actually find a lot more about the history of that watch. So, for example, some of the watches, I'm able to know which submarine it was issued to, which is just really cool to me. I'm a, I'm a fan of submarines. And now I, when I wear that watch, I get to pretend to be a submariner for the day. <laughs> um, and, and, and also you get a little view into the life that that watch lived. And I like that it's, so it almost, when you frame it that way, you're not really a watch collector. You're almost living a history. Definitely. Right? I mean, it, it's like you're a very specific history fan where you're uncovering a story rather than just saying, oh, I want this watch and this looks good on my shelf. Absolutely. And that's kind of the uh, the thing that, one of the things that will that I'll be up late at night hunting is the history of this watch or the unit that this watch was issued to. What happened to that submarine? You know, <laughs> they started piecing it off, and maybe I can buy a, another piece of the submarine or something like that, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> like, or, I, or, I, I don't know if your family's going to want pieces of submarines. I am yeah. looking for a periscope if anybody knows. Of, okay. Um, okay. But um, but a lot of times it's sometimes I'll find the watch and. I know it's a French Navy watch, but I don't have the documentation. And that's, that's the beginning of a treasure hunt for me, right? That, that will have me reaching out to collectors all over the world to find little pieces. Do you know this, that sort of thing, and then piece together that story. And uh, I felt like after I've done that for so many watches, I need to give back to the community and capture some of these for the next, the next collectors to come along. How big is this community? When you say you're reaching out, to all these other French Navy watch collectors. I mean, is there, are there like six of you and you all just kind of know who you are and you just do that? Or, you know, where is this interest? Because I know that there's watch collecting. I know that there's military history interest, both of, bo both of which are huge. French Navy is very specific. Where, where is this world? What is this audience? And, and tell me about it. It is. And it, it's, the, the size of it, it has slowly revealed itself to me, right? You know, as an American who doesn't speak French, uh, there really wasn't much of a local community interested in these watches. It, in the early days of my collecting, it was me looking over the, you know, at forums in French using Google Translate to try and understand what they were talking about. And sometimes five, six, maybe a decade earlier before I was looking at this, right? So that community existed there. Um, and I was the outsider looking in. Now, after doing this for a while, and it's kind of having written the book, um, people sort of know that, you know, at least in America, I'm kind of one of the, the, the main collectors on this. And that community right now, I would say like maybe 30, 40 people that I, I know for sure are into this, uh, like I am, and that's great. Uh, but the cool thing was that you have to... Um, if you can't tap into that community, you know, some genres have their own communities that are thriving, they're hundreds, thousands, whatever. Um, but even if you're the only one for your new niche, you can create that community. And it's, it's not true. that hard these days with uh, social media. And I, and oh, that's a great point because, you know, I've talked on, on the show is your community now is no longer dictated by geography. And I think that was one of the other things we learned in the middle of the pandemic is that we could start to pick the people we want to spend our time with. And as you've shown, do you speak French now? No. no, no I hope okay. you're that. <laughs> so now, now you still don't even speak French. You've been doing this for how long? And you've yeah. got this community of people. That's amazing to me. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, it, it was a it, it's not something I would have expected because in the beginning I was like, I don't. 
I don't even speak the language. I don't know who's out there. I can't find these people. But slowly putting yourself out there and whatever's your truth, right? Your first Instagram post, you use the right tag. Slowly that community will build and you can play an active role in that. Um, even locally, um, I, I wanted to find a, a, just a set of vintage watch collectors just near me, right? So I just started with one post of like, hey, I'm going to be at this location on Thursday night at six. We want to talk vintage watches, show up. And two or three people showed up. And then wow. the next week we did it again. And now, uh, you know, there's a group uh, of, you know, maybe 30, 40 of us. And, you know, that WhatsApp group is always, you know, live and it's expanded sometimes beyond watches, right? To, to form friendships and connections and just helping each other out on, on things that are totally unrelated to watches. And I, what I like about that too, is that I guess it's with any relationship, you have to put some effort into it at the beginning and you will attract the people that you need to attract. So you took the steps to do that, which is great. And now it's evolving into to something bigger. Yeah. And again, you, you know, if there's an existing tribe, join it. If not, make your own and, and that they'll, they'll come out and you, you know, it doesn't have to be the one tribe you're in. Right. But when you mm -hmm. find that uh, immediately, when you go there, you, you feel safe and you just like, because you're, you're one of, one of them. It's your people. That's right. That's cool. So I want to talk about your book. All right. Which I have, and I love it. Uh, <laughs> Marine Nationale, right? Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah. I'm trying to learn French, but yeah. I haven't learned the French <laughs> language yet. Um, it's available at blurb.com. Before we go into this, what was the moment where you said French Navy watches, this is it? Like, this is where, because you weren't, it didn't seem like you were necessarily a watch fanatic beforehand. Tell me why, why all this started. So at the beginning of my collecting, I started looking online and like watches, where do I start? Right. And Hodinkee uh, was a newer site at the time. And I came up across this article on Hodinkee that was entitled just because a Tudor issued to the French Navy. And it had this beautiful picture of a Tudor Submariner watch um, on top of a piece of paper that looked really interesting and old. Right. And it turns out that that paper was something called a decommissioned paper, which was a piece of paper that kind of followed the watch around during its uh, service in the Navy and ultimately stuck with that watch when it was auctioned off at a government auction. And that piece of paper had the watch's serial number, the date it was issued to the French Navy, what uh, base it was used at or what vessel, and a little bit of detail uh, about it. And that, I was like, that is so cool. I need to know more about that. And, uh, and that, that set me off on this treasure hunt. So it literally just came out of nowhere. It did. It you did. just stumbled upon it. And it's kind of like those people who are looking for, you know what, I need to get married. I need to find a spouse. And you say, stop looking and you'll meet them in the, you know, random aisle at the supermarket when you happen to be there. I, I met my wife at Costco. So I'm all right. <laughs> so, but, but it's that, that spark, right. For me. And, and you know, a lot of, I think it's it's there for people. You don't have to force it, right? It you will know what is the thing that you are actually searching for late at night in bed, and that you're staying up instead of sleeping. That's probably something close to it. Like follow that, see where it goes, right? And I followed that to a point where it started with one uh, one watch. I'm, I'm wearing it now, right? Nice. And then ended up at 34, and I was like, geez, I probably have probably maybe the largest collection of these under one roof. Um, I, I think maybe there's a book here. And uh, I guess I want to give back and piece together a lot of these stories that I had threads in from various forums, collector, you know, arcane knowledge, things I had figured out, put it all together in one place. Um, and basically, the, the nugget is, I wanted to make the book that I wish I could have bought in the beginning of this journey. It didn't exist. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't think it even existed in French, right? There were like little chapters or, you know, a couple pages in larger watch tomes, but nothing fully dedicated to this and the, the wide range of watches. So that, that was my goal is to, to make the book that I wish I could have bought. And uh, yeah. what I like about the book is 
I know nothing about watches. Um, but I'm fascinated with all the stuff that's in here. And I don't know. I mean, we talked a little bit about how you're an Instagram person. I don't really go on Instagram and everything else, but like the picture thing, it's, it makes you appreciate these little tiny things that you would never notice. Yeah. When you were just fly, like if I came flying into somebody with a collection, all of a sudden now you're looking at little minute details and reading the story, you say, wow, like I would never think that this book would be something that I'd actually want to sit down and, and I'd rip through saying, oh, that's really interesting. So now yeah. I feel like I'm kind of a French Navy watch fan. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, welcome to the club. Yeah, uh, you know, the minutia in uh, vintage watches is is really, that's where it's at, right? And, yeah. and on the military side. So one of one example of that is, uh, you know, on vintage watches, if you open up the case back, there's a bunch of hand scrawled chicken scratches on the inside of the case back, which are um, indications of when a watchmaker serviced the watch, right? They, they write down on it what they did and when last, you know, the date of service, that sort of thing. A lot of times those goes, go overlooked. But in there is the key for French Navy, certain French Navy watches, because one of those watchmakers that was making those chicken scratches in there was actually like a, a designated watchmaker for the French Navy, right? He, he, his shop was about 100 yards outside the French Navy base. You know, when the boats came in, they put all the watches in the bag, carried over to him. He'd service it, right? You know, make little chicken scratches, but also write down what he did in this book that, that collectors call the register, the ledger. It's this mythical, like, holy grail tome. Uh, and after he passed away, that tome ended up in private collector hands. And so if you find one of those watches, you open up and you see this watchmaker's inscription, you can reach out to the, the keeper of the register and ask them like, hey, is this watch in there? If so, you can get a copy of that page and they'll tell you, oh, this watch was issued to this commando unit. Oh, and it came in oh. three times and that sort of thing. And so matching that history to the watch is kind of like, I feel like my mission. Yeah, that's neat. Now, so I feel like that's also an aspect of authenticity. I wanna talk more about Spark in a minute, but yeah. the authenticity question of watches I feel like French Navy watches are a little under the radar. So you, you can just kind of find the authenticity and you can say, yes, this is real. Like, not, I don't imagine many people are making fake 19, 20 French Navy watches. Uh, unfortunately, it, it is happening as their their value um, goes up, as is in any collection, right? So you have to, to look for it. But uh, a lot of times... Uh, what I'll tell people is like, you know, be, be a sheep, right? I mean that um, if you're going to buy your first one, um, stick to one that kind of ticks all the boxes of a typical one. Look, in terms of finding that one off example where they made a pink dial instead of a blue dial, like I'm at the front of that line. I want that. <laughs> That's like <laughs> expert level kind of thing. You know, don't you're going to lose your shirt, you know. And if you're going to do that, or even if you're going to buy one that looks like everything else is just reach out to the community. They're super friendly. Like I can't tell you the number of times that I've just pinged random people on Instagram and said, Hey, it looks like you have a couple of these types of watches. I'm thinking about buying one. Can you just take a look at this? And tell me anything you like hundred percent all the time. They're coming back with like, looks good. Or actually you might want to check out this, that sort of thing. And the community is just super well, uh, warm and welcoming in that regard. That's cool. So finding, so if I'm processing this, we've got spark and interest, uh, finding your community, right? Like we could find all of these things. You said your spark could be anything. And I like how you frame it. It's the thing that keeps you up at night. Sometimes I'll say it's, you know, how do you lose track of time while you're doing it? Yes. Um, so, right. Right. Talk to me about your flow do you have to be open to finding a spark? Um, because I think that's many people just don't know where to begin. So how do you yeah. just get started? You know, if, as we talked about, maybe you're lucky and you're just doing something and it totally derails the rest of your day. <laughs> look, I was supposed to do work and all this sort of stuff, but then I happened to read this article at lunch and next thing I know, I look up and I've been researching French Navy watches like, you know, you know, May or, may or may not be true, right? <laughs> Maybe that happened to me, right? Um, as long as you're not billing hours. As long as you're not billing hours. Right. 
That's great. No client was built for that, right? Um, but but if you don't have that, I also think you can find it in other ways. I mean, you don't have to force it to extent. But one of the other uh, things I found uh, myself, or you know, totally outside of watches, was going back and relearning something that I used to know. So my undergraduate degree is in biochemistry. That was a long time ago. <laughs> like, yep. and I, I kind of felt it, it sometimes ashamed of of having the degree, but not being able to know everything that I once knew. Right. I mean, it, and I found myself um, uh, take using the time of the pandemic to take some online education classes through, uh, in this case, HMX or Harvard Medical School online. And it was really great to take a, a class called biochemistry, where I already kind of had a, a, a leg up because I had gone through it before. And so when I would go through and relearn the material, it was, it was I could actually absorb it and just enjoy it a little bit more. And it was one of the best things I did over the pandemic. And I found myself in a flow in that state of relearning something else. You know, I don't know that I want to go and become a biochemist in, in the lab and all that, but that was a great thing. And it got me started with that, that learning, right? Um, it's a good pairing to be a learner somewhere. Um, right. And that's, that's, that's a great pairing to, you know, I use the analogy, kids are happy because they're constantly learning. Adults aren't because they have mm -hmm. to have the answers. And finding something you can learn about, because I guess that's ultimately what you're doing. I mean, we're talking about reading about history, compiling the stuff, putting the stories in the book. Storytelling is about learning and learning the history of these watches so that you can share it. And that's so I guess learning is is the key to spark. For, for me, it was. I and mean, it still fuels me. And the thing is, is like, I don't know it all. There's probably facts in here that are totally wrong, right? And I can't wait to find out which ones those are. So we can update it. But I think that you also have to go, especially when you're diving into, you know, a space like this, or probably many spaces, is just to have that humility and say, look, like this is what I understand, but it doesn't mean it's accurate. And nobody really knows what the exact history of this particular watch is. And so you have to go in with a little bit of flex flexibility. And I think part of that is, you know what, the flex, the learning, um, the having fun with it. Like all yeah. of those are, you know, when you go in, someone's starting at the gym saying, you know what, I'm intimidated by what I don't know about how to use the machines. Um, screw it. I'm just going to go in. I'm going to have fun. I'm going to ask someone a question. I'm going to try and do it. If I look like an idiot, I'll leave it. I'll never come back. But you go in and you have fun. You could yeah. do that across anything. I, I, I absolutely. I want to, one, one more thought, and I want to come back to that, was that um, you also, in terms of spark, you might look back into your past. You know, what were you into as, as a kid at 10? What were you doing? Like, you know, I had, uh, I, I would collect GI Joes as a kid, not collect. I was just, that, that was just my toy. It was just what yeah. I played with. And I would like save the little cutouts on the back of the cardboard box with the secret top secret file of who, you know, what their real identity was. And I still have that somewhere. I am convinced there's a GI Joe collector community out there. Right. Guarantee it. Probably yeah. doesn't cost that much to get into and just having fun just because. Right. Um, in terms of the, uh, uh, you know, guess, getting started and you mentioned going to the gym, I think people need to be comfortable just trying something, like you said, just for fun, but just call it an experiment. Right. If if you just say, look, I want to start going to have Mexican food every Friday night from here on forever. That's a very different proposition than like, hey, how about an experiment? This Friday, let's try Mexican. You know, if it's great, maybe we'll start a new tradition. If not, hey, you know, we'll try something else next week. But the the entry level, the, the table stakes are a lot lower. And so whatever your new hobby is, like, hey, you know, I'm going to try this one. I'm going to go to the workout class one, one day and just see how it goes. No big deal. Um, or, or It's much easier to get into it versus like, for the next 10 years, I am going to be a watch collector of this type Like, <laughs> and try it. And, and I think one more thought on that note was that you have to make contact with the real world of your passion very, as soon as possible. Like, and for me, the best teacher of vintage watches was when I bought my first one. It's like, it was super scary because all these questions that, that you raised, how do I know it's real? How do I know this? You do as much homework, but at some point you've got to just make that first step. That's right. And there's nothing you like learning from when you're holding that first one, learning about what, what you did right and what, what maybe you got wrong. And I, yeah, experience is the ultimate teacher, right? I could tell you not to touch the stove, 
but you're going to keep trying to touch the stove until you actually get burned. Absolutely. Um, and yeah. when you experience that and find, I mean, it's a rush to try something new. It's a rush to take these little types of risk um, to do those little whatever, you know, I'm going to put myself out there and, and try and do a podcast or I'm going to try and do these things. You know, what would, what will the neighbor say? Um, but if you just say, Oh, I'm just trying it once. It's no big deal. Can you teach someone to change their mentality? Because I feel like, and I, I read this article a long time. Why, why does everyone have to run a marathon? Why can't you just go for a jog? Yeah. Right. Why does everyone have to do an Ironman? Why not just go for a bike ride? like a 20 minute bike ride. It doesn't have to be. And I'm very guilty of going like crazy over the top. How do we get someone to live more in the moment rather than thinking about, is this sustainable for the next 20 years of my life? Yeah. Uh, I like to think of it as learning to love version zero dot crap, right? Which is like, and you know, thinking about the book, it's like this, this book, um, 240 pages, 34 watches, pictures, text. Um, this wasn't V1. <laughs> or, or like this is V1, but before that, there was like two other versions, right? And this was my version, zero dot crap, which is like, hey, it's not perfect. It's not the final product, but I need to learn quickly, right? And this is a book, my, you know, just pictures, right? There's, there's no text. This is French Navy watches. There's only like uh, it's about 60 of these out there. Because I was just testing the waters. What can I learn real quick? I could have spent a couple of years putting together the book and then tried to learn, or I could have made you know the prototype version, get it out there, and learn a lot. Right? I learned what kind of publisher I might need. You know, or how how's the photography? How are people going to react? What's the pricing? All these sorts of things. And so, like what we talked about before, like the table stakes are a lot lower if you don't have to have perfection on that first time, and that's okay. And you can even tell people. Hey, uh, you know, um, like if you're putting together a presentation at work or something, instead of spending all, all night and weeks getting every pixel just right, you could put together that rough draft in 15 minutes, send it to people say, this is just a draft. It's version zero dot crap. I know it's not good. Don't tell me about the for formatting. Just tell me, what do you think about the content? Yeah. And then you're, you're iterating much quicker. And it even applies to books on French Navy watches too. Because we're our own worst enemy, right? We, we kind of question everything and we, we have everything in our head. But one of the things I want to point out about version zero point crap yeah. is that you took all the pictures. Like if, if you were to say to someone, um, I want you to make a book on this, they're going to be like, I don't know how to make a book. You actually broke down the steps to say, what do I need to do? I need pictures for this book. Click. You took your pictures. You know, with a... a Cell phone. All the pictures are from the phone you have in your pocket. You don't need anything fancy. And then you turned it into it. And then you like there are tools out there. And it's basically curious about if I want to write a book, what are the things I have to do to write a book and just figuring out the steps? Yeah, literally, uh, you know, this was just a collection of photos in, in Google Photos. They have <laughs> just like many photo servers, you pick 30 of them, you hit print book, it shows up. It's the book that you send your the grandparents and that sort of thing. Same thing. That's that's as easy as it, as it can get to, to start. And then when I said, okay, well, people seem to like this. Maybe I should add some text. <laughs> and so, so then I went to actually like the next version, which was kind of a version with text. Um, this is actually a, a brand called Vintage ZRC, another super niche thing. And I had just a little bit of text, not a lot, just a little. And that was the next incremental. And then that set me up to, to make uh, Marine Nationale, which I went with the full text and, you know, just like lots of text and pictures and that sort of thing. And uh, what was cool about this, uh, I learned anybody can make a book and it's really easy. We're very fortunate to live in a time where like um, I happen to use blurb.com um, to make my, uh, make my book. It's a print on demand service. That means I don't have to, there's zero exposure for me. Except my time, right? Yeah, like I, that's it. I, I create the book, I hit upload, and within minutes, it's available for somebody to buy anywhere in the world. When they buy it, that's when they print it and send it to them. I, and I don't have to do anything. I don't have to do any packing, shipping, order management, any of that. I'm done. I'm on to the next book. Right? Yeah, yeah, which is nice. So I guess the the idea then, I mean, this is so translatable for anybody is to just take step one. 
right? Just get, I mean, just start doing things and eventually something will, will float to the top. Absolutely. Like there's when you just, you probably already have the pictures of whatever your hobby is. Pick, pick 30 of them, hit print. When you hold that book in your hand, it's going to spark the next step. It's cool. Right. right. Yeah. 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 It's uh right. You'll never get anything done, which is why I like your iteration kind of, you know, we'll put out version 1.0, 2.0. Um, what is different about you? So go back. How long have you been doing this? Like 10 years? About, yeah. You 10 years ago, opening that watch. Now you're on version three of your book. Um, an expert in French Navy watches, right? We could call you an expert, which is kind of cool. Um, yeah, don't be humble. Um, what have you learned about yourself? I mean, and, and not necessarily just the French Navy watches, but from the macro kind of, I've had this hobby, I've explored this hobby. What's what's different about you as you develop this kind of passion? Yeah, I, I think uh, I've learned a lot about myself through the process. Uh, it reminded me that I like to be creative. And it gave me this outlet. Uh, uh, you know, there, there's a room for creativity in, in the law, but you can't get too creative, <laughs> right? You know? <laughs> so, you know, it's usually more like what's going to keep me out of trouble. Um, uh, but it also gave me some window. I always imagined someday that that I would run my own business, whatever that is. And I, I'm not able to, to get the courage to go and do that all in right now. But this gave me a little baby step just to try it out with zero stakes. You know, it's like I don't have to you know, sacrifice, you know, where the next meal is going to come from. Like it just start, start small. And uh, it, it gave me an opportunity to scratch that itch and then learn a little bit more. I don't think I know everything about what it's going to take to run a business, but I started to get little, little insights there. So th that was nice. It was like uh, um, without risking everything, I got a, a, a little taste. Uh, I also realized that uh, I like to connect people, right? Bringing the community together. Like after I made the book, um, I've held a couple of, you know, uh, you know, kind of informal Zoom gatherings of Marine National fans and collectors, right? And people from all over the world joined that and then have a community that was formed because of that one meeting that's still uh, thriving uh, because of today, you know, WhatsApp room. And that feels good to have connected people. And now they're talking to each other. Maybe they live near each other or maybe they're in opposite ends of the world, but now they're talking and, and they're saying, hey, what do you think about this watch? What do you think about that? Or, hey, I'm going to be in France next month. You know, uh, do you want to get together? Yeah, why not? Right. So that that feels good. That's amazing. The um, I love what you said about the creativity. And learning that you can take a step, right? I mean, the idea of launching a business is overwhelming for a lot of people um, because there's so much risk, but you could take smaller risks. Not everything has to kind of going back to the marathon versus jog thing. Not everything has to be this major incremental kind of, and you learn from everything that you finish, right? You start, you finish, what do I learn? And then do I evolve it? Do I scale it? Do I do whatever? Um, that's great advice. Thank you. Yeah. You're good. I, I like it, Scott. <laughs> right. Um, you and too, my Jim. wife is going to go, so we're going to spend time. My wife has French citizenship, so she's very excited right. about, you know, okay. um, I may have to start <laughs> collecting some French Navy watches. Um, so a quick note on that too. One of the other things I did in the pandemic is I, people are like, this is in English. Where's the French version? Right. I don't speak French. So actually, again, I iterated, I put the whole thing into Google Translate, printed it out, and very quickly found out, like, not a good idea. For <laughs> so I was able, again, that no very low risk, pull that down. You know, I, I didn't have 10,000 yeah. copies of the, the crappy French version, like, <laughs> in my basement somewhere. I just turned that off. I, I, I sold one, tried to find the person that bought it and apologize and get them the, the professionally translated one, which I found, you know, like Fiverr or something like that. I talked to a guy who did professional translation, very nice job. And now it's in another language. So, um, very you know, cool. it's, you, I learned that along the way, but I, you know, started small. Internationally published <laughs> simply because you understood the little steps. 
Yeah. Right. It's we didn't scale things in a way that was or we didn't overwhelm ourselves with, oh, my God, this is the end of the world. It's all right. This is a small puzzle to figure out. And we, we could take the step. Exactly. Yeah. Like in I think in The Martian, you talked about, you know, solve one problem, then move to the next. Right. And keep... Exactly. Exactly. So what's next for you? How can people. So we've got Marine National on Blurb. What's next for in the French Navy world? And how can people uh, find you? Give all your plugs too. Yeah, um, I'm on Instagram at Watchistry, W A T C H I S T R Y. Um, I'm also over the pandemic. I started a YouTube channel. It's a very different universe than Instagram, and so uh, I'm learning there too. I think you know some of my first videos. Like, hopefully, you'll see the progression there, um, and I appreciate the support of the community there. Um, and I think. Actually, one point on that, too, is like one of my early videos, um, you know, again, I just hit record and started showing off watches and uh, I got started but very quickly. I was, I was fortunate enough to receive some feedback that, hey, I love what you're trying to do here, but your your audio really isn't awesome. You're rambling on, you know, put some effort and time into it. And, you know, at first that stung a little bit. Yeah, yeah. It's like. You know, hey, I'm kind of doing this for free, and you know, <laughs> kind of go, go you don't like and, it, don't watch, <laughs> right? You know, yeah. Um, but after I cooled down a bit, took a breath, and then went back, I said, you know, maybe there's something there because I had suspected maybe I could do better, and uh, so now I'm very thankful for that feedback, right? Because it's it's up up the 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 game a little bit there. Do so, you think it's just your ability to be? philosophical that you're able to be okay with that. I mean, I, nobody likes negative feedback, but I don't consider that negative feedback. It's something I need to know so I can improve. Right. And it's, I'm open to learning now. I wasn't always, it took me a long time to get there. How do you get open to, to that kind of feedback? It's a work in progress, right? You know, I, mean, I gotta be honest. It's like, I think it's recognizing like, Hey, if I think back all the times I've received feedback that I've hated it initially, but then whether it's a, a few minutes or a few years later, they come back and I'm like, you know, there was something there. Right? right. And somebody once told me that think of feedback as more of like as a as a flashlight in, in the dark. Right. Hey, there's something over there on, to the right in the woods. I don't know exactly what it is, but there's something there. it's a signal. Right. You don't have to agree with exactly what it is yeah. or every yeah. little bit of the feedback, but take it as like there's something there. And for me, in that example, it was like, there's something there about what I could do to, to, to adapt to this format of YouTube, which is very different than a single picture on Instagram. So. Right, right, right. Whole different dynamic. Yeah. Uh, so, well, I love it. Marine National, we end every podcast with you making a book recommendation. I know you have one, but I also want to make this recommend. I'll make the book you. recommendation here for you. But what's your book recommendation for everybody and why? Thank you. This is a book called What I Know About Running Coffee Shops. It's by Colin Harmon. He's the founder of a, a, an Irish coffee uh, chain uh, called 3FE or 3FE. I'm actually not sure how to pronounce it. Uh, but what I loved about the book, and it's one of those books where like, I'll be honest, I haven't finished it, right? I'm actually savoring it. Like I, 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 I it may take me months to read this book because I, I, I like it that much. And it's very bite making you learn and think. Right, and 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 he's not coming in and say like here's everything you know on how to make a coffee shop he's he's saying here's my truth right here's my experience about what i learned about customers or what the display should look like and so it was just a very cool even though you know i i don't know maybe someday i'll open a coffee shop but like uh even if it i could don't be your business that's right as you launch you can yeah. launch whatever kind of business owner you want yeah that's grueling though you got to yeah. get up early yeah yeah I'm working on that. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, Scott, this has been um, this has been amazing. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you, I Jennifer. love the ideas on what it takes to find a spark, what it takes to stick with purpose. I love learning the stories of these watches just because from a curiosity perspective is extremely interesting. But being open to learning, being open to trying something new being open to focusing on whatever it is that you want to evolve and just taking that step, that first step towards version zero dot crap, um, which I'm going to tweet everywhere now is, uh, is pretty good. Um, Scott, thank you for being here.
Thank you, Jim, for having me. It was a pleasure. And everybody, as always, bellwetherhub.com. All of our episodes are on there. Um, reach out to Scott at Watchistry on Instagram. Check out his YouTube channel. I'll put links to all of that underneath the podcast post that goes on the webpage. And Scott, thank you again. And I look forward, everyone, to seeing you next time. Thank you for joining.